Welcome to Ridgecrest Talk, your host Paul Vanderwerf. Back into the garden scene in the Indian Wells Valley. Yes, we do garden in the Indian Wells Valley. Uh, my guest today is uh, Donna Thomas with the Oasis uh, Garden Club of Indian Wells Valley. Uh, Donna, we, we had you on, what, this, the, this last fair, was that October, November? In, in October, yes. And we were talking about the um, great way to, to see about some of the plants was the flower show. Right. But those are typically cuttings and, and samples that are brought in uh, to, for people to come in and see inside the building. Right. But now we have another event. And that event is going to be outdoors, and people can actually see the, the real plants in the ground. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that yes. event coming up? This is our uh, annual self-guided garden tour. And what, <clears throat> what we do is we select some yards around town and uh, get their permission to be on the tour. And then we write up a ticket describing some of the plants in the, in the yards and some of the features, there are water features, sometimes there are ponds or um, in the zero scape yards there'll be a dry stream bed and things like that. But it's a way for you to actually see a lot of the plants growing in landscapes in town. And if you're interested in removing some of your grass, there are some yards that have a lot of the zero scape and a great selection of zero scape plants so that you can see what they look like uh, when they're blooming, how big they get, and uh, how well they do in this climate. Right, and um, being a, a great idea, having a garden tour, getting people who move into the valley and the people who've been here who want to see something new, an opportunity to actually go to the neighbors and see what they're doing and, and get new ideas, especially with the drought and trying to save, save water and be efficient in what we're doing. So this is a new idea. How many years has this been going on? <laughs> well, this is our 53rd annual tours. So okay, wait a minute. Here in Indian Wells Valley, this is the 53rd year. <laughs> yes. So it's not real new. No, we do it every year. And uh, you go at your own pace, you follow the map. We have a map also along with the write-ups of the yards. And you just go at your own pace, might take a break for lunch and then look at the rest of the yards later. We do have one yard where we have a refreshment stop where people can get some lemonade and cookies and things like that, take a little break. Right, and I, and I think that's one of the things that's really neat, it's self-paced. If you come to one yard that, for whatever reason, it's not really what you want to look at, you can kind of go through it quickly, versus you come to another yard that just really, wow, i got to stop and, and take this in, you can spend a half an hour, an hour, hour and a half, possibly. Now, we're starting at 9 o'clock on Saturday. Right. What time does it finish? We finish at 5. So from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., if mm -hmm. you stroll through eight hours, you could, you could almost take um, 30, 45 minutes at each location. Right. And so that yes. also gives you time that you could start right at 9 and probably go through quickly and be done by like 1. Right. Or you could start later, like at 11 or 12, and still get done by 5 o'clock. Right. And we put a sign uh, in front, in the front of each of the yards so that to help people find the location, you know. It says Oasis Garden Tour on the sign and it's embedded in the ground in the front yard area. All right. So we're, we're not quite there yet where we have the GPS route for the, the electronic <laughs> folks out there. But they can, when they, when they get their um, list, they can go ahead and punch those in on their own uh, GPS or whatever they have in their car, which will help them. Help and them even if it. they're not uh, that savvy, we still have the signs and, and you know, Ridgecrest isn't that big. It comes with a map. Right. And, and the route actually makes sense. It starts over by the front gate near the hospital. And I looked at it, it looks like everything's on the west side. It's kind of like the west side tour, <laughs> um, kind of starting from near the hospital, coming all the way up towards the college. Right, there's um, one last place up, up the hill by the college. Right, kind of between mm -hmm. China Lake Boulevard and up, John. Pretty much everything is in that corridor. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you're going to see a huge variety. Now, right. when we talk about variety, um, I think everybody kind of expects they're going to see some cactus, and some some kind of that desert, dry, arid kind of zero scape look. But what is, what is the other variety? What are the other types of things they might see? Well, we have uh, one yard on the tour this year where the couple uh, likes to garden by having things in containers, pots, different size pots throughout their yard. You know, they have some things planted in the ground, like the big shade tree in the front, but they prefer to to garden in pots. So that's one different aspect. And we also have a yard that has a pond in it with koi fish and goldfish and um, lush 
grass area in the back and a nice fire pit and things like that. So you'll see a variety of things. Right. On so the you, tour. you can actually get some ideas for recreation and entertainment a fire pit, a, um, a koi pond, something that's just very peaceful and relaxing to go right. out and just kind of get away from everything. Different hardscape areas, different patio setups, you know, in some of the homes. And, um, um, arches and gateways and you know little garden areas for succulents or cactus and then you have a variety of a mixture of plants in some yards right and now one of the things you said was was one of the houses would have a lot of potted plants so in the pots that seems like uh, some flexibility now now is that just to grow plants that you have to move in so they don't freeze or or what what is the reason for having potted plants I don't know I think they just like to have them in pots <laughs> It's kind of the style that's something that they've right. been experimenting and playing with and right. that seems to be yeah. working well. It could help, though, to move things into. Um, there is a little, one of the yards has a small greenhouse, and he does move his succulents into the greenhouse in the wintertime. Right, and that's something protection. that if you're not here that long, well, you might be able to take a, a cactus or a succulent or something that's maybe from South America, Central America, and it'll last here three to five years. And then all of a sudden, that fifth, sixth year, we get that real long deep freeze Frost. and it's, it's yeah. just not going to survive that winter without somehow either covering it or getting it out. So you were mentioning that the, the one gardener is able to move that into a greenhouse right. which is going to bring that temperature up 20, 30 degrees and right. stop it from freezing like right. that. Right, for winter protection. Right. Right. And I always tell people, you know, it's, it's usually easier to grow like a plum tree or um, a pear tree and it's harder to grow a citrus tree. And then um, someone says, oh, we have a citrus tree and it's doing really well. And then I would say, well, is it in the ground or is it potted? <laughs> <laughs> so you could do certain things when you want to get things out of the, that possible freeze right. with the potted plant. Right. And um, it, it just seems like different, um, different styles and it's something you have to learn, learn to grow with pots. I, I don't do a lot of uh, growing with pots, but I can see um, some real benefits, especially um, if you want to get a more of a variety of plants. Right. Um, they just had the mm -hmm. one sale, I think, at the local store. I got a, a big uh, house plant, normally like $15 for $5. And the first worry is, oh, I'm going to kill this. But then the second thing is, um, how, how easy is that to grow in the desert? I can't just leave it outdoors. It's too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. But we do have house plants, too. Are, are any of the houses that we're going to have demonstrating any of the house type? plants? Yes, yeah, some of them have a patio area and they'll take a corner of the patio, maybe put in a small fountain, you know, recycled, using recycled water for a fountain, and then gather their house plants around the fountain for a corner area in the patio. Wow, it sounds like we're going to see quite a variety if we, if we can get up and figure out where this tour is. And we're going to talk some more about how to get, get to the tour. We're getting ready for our first break. But we're, we're talking about an annual event here in the Valley for the 53rd year right. that we can uh, take a garden tour on Saturday and go all over the, the, the community, basically in that quarter from the front gate, China Lake Boulevard, up to the college, up, to, up John on the west side. Right. And we're going to talk about that some more. But first, let's go on break. Rich Crest Talk. Uh, we're having a lot of fun here. And welcome back to Ridgecrest Talk. Your host, Paul Vanderorf, with Donna Thomas from the Oasis Garden Club of Indian Wells Valley, talking about the annual, the 53rd annual garden tour here in, in the community in the Indian Wells Valley, here, here specifically in Ridgecrest, this tour. And one of the things that I had done uh, just, I think, a month or two ago is I'd gone up to Northern California and I had uh, just received this book, was my reminder. Alan Savory uh, from Zimbabwe came and gave a talk about uh, responsibly taking care of, of the lands and and stopping desertification and, and improving the soil and looking at how we uh, do things. And one of the big things he said was to work with animals and plants. A lot of times we just think of plants and we just think of animals, but there's actually this interrelationship among those. And I know we were right. talking on the break about um, one of the homes had to back out of the uh, um, tour, Yeah, but it a... has tortoises and, and you can actually see the animals in the yard and hopefully we'll be able to maybe get that back the right. next year. Yeah, they're hoping to do it next year. They had a family emergency and have to take uh, one of the parents down to the hospital in Lancaster. 
so they won't be home on Saturday. Right. Now, on the um, talking about that with the plants, um, I remember one lady I talked to I wanted to get back to, she had a butterfly garden. And so what she was doing is planting specific plants to attract certain um, creatures like the butterfly um, so that they had a space here in the community um, with the rainfalls that we've had, at least for those few weeks. Right. They had plenty of desert flowers, but regardless, we still it's still good in, within the community to have something like the butterfly garden. Um, do we have any of the other gardens that are that you can think of? Are, are there certain plants that are attracting birds or or other other creatures? Yes, the um, the home that we have where we have our refreshment stop, uh, the gentleman there planted mulberry trees, fruiting mulberry trees, and things like that because he's an avid bird watcher and he enjoys watching the birds. And he has a nice gazebo area in the backyard where we're gonna enjoy our refreshments. But then he also has a lot of uh, salvias, bird of paradise, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of blooming things that attract the birds. All right, and that just makes sense. I was uh, kind of surprised to learn this, but the actual uh, most popular group for people to join in the entire country is garden clubs. And number two, right behind that, is the bird societies like the Audubon Bird Society and so forth. So here to find somebody who's an avid bird person and a gardening enthusiast, they kind of go hand in hand. Because right. if you're going to attract your birds, you're going to want to have those types of plants. We always hear fruitless mulberry. I have a fruitless mulberry in my yard. But you're saying he actually has the mulberries, which some people avoid just because there's so much work to clean up, right? Right. But, but at the, the same time, <laughs> yeah, your birds are um, they're going to be whistling a lot of thank yous. Uh, right. for getting those mulberries. He also has a special fruiting mulberry in the front of his house which he calls a white fruiting mulberry and he said it is the mulberry tree that produces the uh, fruit for the silkworm. I don't know if we would ever have silkworms in this valley but that, that is the type of tree that attracts and uh, provides food for the silkworms. And, and talking about kind of changing the way you think about things. I was down at the Southern California Garden Club last week and they had a person talking from the Audubon Society of San Fernando Valley and he was talking specifically how they're looking at these weather patterns and how it's warming and changing and because of that the birds are going to be shifting and migrating into different patterns farther north than they've been in the past and along with that they need the same plants to be moving with them too and that's a real challenge because if mm -hmm. If our temperatures are warming too quickly, our plants are not going to migrate. It might take the plants a thousand years to get where the birds want to be in five years. Right. And that really made me think, oh, we can't just say what's native for my community. If we're going to have some different birds in here and, and we're not paying attention to the birds, we don't know that, hey, we have to be planting these other types of uh, plants and have right. that variety. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the bird watchers are more aware of that. They, they spot that one bird say, hey, that bird's not supposed to be here or it's not supposed to be here this early or this late in the season. There's something different about the migration pattern this year. Mm -hmm. And so there really is a, an, an argument, yes, we do want to have native plants. We do want to um, not bring in invasive species. But um, I joke with people, my, my niece said, oh, you can't have bamboo in the desert, that's invasive. And I said, well, if it doesn't get water, it's not going to go very far. And, right. I, and I think that's an advantage we have here in the desert. Is yeah, we right. can plant a lot of plants that uh, are not going to take over everything. Right. And so um, a great opportunity, I mean, I mean, to just get educated. Is this just for people who are um, garden enthusiasts that are going to come out, or is this something that's good just for, say, a young family or somebody who's new to the area? W what's the recommendation for who would be interested in this event? Well, I think it would appeal to lots of people, lots of different people. Um, there is one couple that have their yard on the house, a house on the <coughs> landscaping on the on the tour this year and they've only been in the area about three years but the yard was planted previously by another man and his son but it contains a lot of uh, xeriscape and xeric plants and succulents and a variety of blooming plants and uh, that would be a good yard to vis to visit to see some of the plants if you're planning to remove some of the grass in your yard and change to a more um, garden variety of xeric plants. Right. Now on a self-paced tour you don't have a tour guide who's pointing out and answering all these questions so no. do they actually label the plants or are the homeowners there? How does that work? No we try to describe from our write-up you know the location whether it's along the sidewalk or along the front of the yard 
one yard has a tiered, three tiers of uh, plantings in the front. And we try to describe the location so that they can identify the plant. Right. And I think another tool that people should recognize is you bring your cell phone, which has a camera on it, you take a picture of something you're interested in, even if you don't know what it is. Right. And you can always um, share that with other people and say, hey, what is this? This is something I'm interested in. And I did that up in Northern California. I had a, uh, it was a potato plant, beautiful purple mm -hmm. flower, and it was a big kind of a bush. And I wasn't sure what it was. But I had people asking questions and thinking about it just within 15 minutes of the post. And so I, I think that's a, a, another way that we can get more information. We're going to talk some more right. about um, this event at the uh, Oasis Garden Club right after this break. This is Rich Crest Talk, and uh, thank you for joining us. And Rich Crest Talk, your third segment and final segment, talking about the Oasis Garden Club's 53rd Annual Garden Tour. And we were talking about being a self-paced tour, that we have all different types of people that are going to be coming around from house to house, maybe uh, around 10, 10 homes throughout the uh, community. And since it's self-paced, you may not know what a plan is or how it's set up, but bring, around, bring, 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 <laughs> bring along your camera, take yeah. pictures, and then when you're around somebody or you can post on the internet, uh, you can share that information. I have one funny story. Uh, one of the local Facebook posts for the gardening groups, a lady said, I just moved here and there's this new plant growing in my yard and I don't know if, if it's something I want to keep. Does anybody know what this is? Mm -hmm. And of course I got on there and helped her out and I said, it's called a tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> and so she had never seen the small green tumbleweed and she didn't realize what it was going to turn into. But right. that's just kind of typical of when you move in a new area, you don't know um, what plants are if, if, if you haven't been around them. Right. And so uh, that's a great, I think a great way is to, is to take the pictures, uh, maybe come with a uh, couple people, a mm -hmm. couple friends, might have more experience. Um, typically it's not a whole lot of kids, right? You might have well, a few, yes. one, one or two, but it's not probably the best idea to drag four or five little ones with you. You're going to be chasing them around instead of being able to really <laughs> enjoy the garden. Right. And maybe at the refreshment stop, some of our Oasis members that will be serving the cookies and the lemonade can answer some questions about some of the plants. You know, some have gardened in this area for over 30 years, some of our members. Right. So actually, um, there's one, one home that they're going to have set up with an additional table with some snack items and with some volunteers there who can answer questions right. and kind of uh, steer you in the right direction if you don't know some information. And there's right. actually, we've kind of had this one kind of new thing to the Valley that, that we haven't talked about yet. Um, I have actually had the, uh, the creators on the show in the past is our community gardens. We're starting to get some community gardens. And are, were you able to get any of the community gardens on your tour this year? We have two, two of the community gardens on the tour, the one near the police department and um, and the one by the Presbyterian Church on Las Flores Avenue. So we have those two on our on right. our And we had Dr. Gunasinga um, come in just, I think, a month or two ago and talk about there's a very small community garden right on that back corner of City Hall where the police department is, right. kind of uh, just at the edge of Freedom Park, which is right behind City Hall. And um, I've stopped by there a few times. Every once in a while I'll see a volunteer and I'll talk to him and ask how things are going. But I bet you there's lots of people that don't even know we have a community garden there. Yes. And I think that's what Dr. Gunsinger was wanting to do, is to get something out in public, in public view, that people can start thinking and get the conversation started of having public spaces where we do have edible food. Right. And then they collect things as they ripen or as they get mature and um, give them away, you know, to people that are in need or to other groups like the Women's Center or the Senior Center and various places. Right. And I think that's, uh, when I've talked to gardeners who are, are getting more serious with gardening, they typically have 90% in excess of what they need. So whether they're, you know, all the neighbors getting tired of them knocking on their door with all the extras, or in this case, they're going to the women's shelter, they're going to possibly the churches or the other local groups and saying, hey, we have extra, right. how can we get these to the right people? Right. And that's, that's a, great, um, a great reason to have a community garden. Now, we're also talking at the Presbyterian Church. Yes, and that one has the raised bed gardens 
you know, that were put in there. So it's slightly different than the one at the police, behind the police uh, building. Um, so Mark Morley is the caretaker for that garden. And I think he works with a Girl Scout troop and with some of the church members there. Right. Yeah, if I recall right, we had um, Hannah Van Neville was the Girl Scout who had kind of organized that project. And I was kind of um, surprised to hear how she described it because usually you think as a young person that doing a project like that would be this huge undertaking that would be life-saving, life-changing and, and um, pulling your hair out. And Hannah said, oh, it was so easy. I just asked for help, and everybody came out to help. <laughs> and I just thought, wow. You know, the church came out to help. The community yeah. came out to help. And then once Hannah got that set up, then she turned it over to Mark. And Mark is the uh, kind of the garden master, if you, you say, to kind of keep that going right. on a, on a long-term basis. And uh, one of the things I remember Mark mentioning to me was there right next to the Seventh-day Adventist school. And, and yes. he had mentioned that the Seventh-day Adventists, who were always um, encouraging healthy eating, we're kind of looking over at the community garden and what are you guys doing over here? And uh, from what I've heard, and it's still kind of early, but we're looking at a uh, farmer's market at the Seventh-day Adventist property, hopefully starting, uh, I think it's going to be like July 14th or 15th. And so the word is starting to circulate in the community. The, I first saw the official word about two weeks ago, but I just looked the other day. I think there's a Facebook site. If you uh, look at Ridgecrest Community, or what it would be, Ridgecrest Farmer's Market, that they already have over 250 people who've connected wow. and are anticipating doing something like that. That's so you can really great. see it starts with with the gardens, and then we have the public spaces like at the church and at the city hall, and then uh, we're building on that in, into a farmer's market, which every community n needs. Right now, our, our nearest farmer's market is 45 miles away. Right. And yeah. so you're going to go see um, different plants that are native as well as um, drought tolerant and just a whole variety even with some water features but we're also going to see the two community gardens which are brand new to the community so they're brand new to the tour right and so that, that, that sounds like a, a huge uh, interest at this time with the water we are so so let's tell the audience before we run out of time um, so far if they haven't gotten their tickets they could have got their tickets at a couple places in the community right where yes, where the, are, the, are those? tickets are on sale at the matarango museum and the red rock bookstore and then also you can get them from oasis garden club members right so if you have a neighbor that you know is a garden club member you can just knock on their door and say hey do you have any tickets left right and then um if if they're just seeing this and they still don't have their tickets they can still show up at our site that's going to be hosted correct yes the uh, house on sanders south sanders street where we're having the refreshments we'll also have tickets available at that and that's at seven that stop seven zero six south sanders seven zero eight right? i think south sanders. we better get the right house so everyone's going to be knocking at every <laughs> at the wrong door was it 708? I think so. I'm going to look on our map here. And we're going to post this also on the KZGN site just to get people at the right place. I don't, I don't have my glasses on there. Is he right? 708 South Sanders. So right. you can show up at 9 o'clock in the morning or all the way up to probably 3 or 4 in the afternoon right. and get a ticket. Get a what ticket. Is it, what does the ticket cost? It's $5 for and adults. It's only $5? Yeah. And that supports the local home. garden club and the community? Right. And we're out of time. Donna, thank you so much for joining me. This is uh, Ridgecrest Talk, KZGN, talking with Donna Thomas about the garden tour this uh, Saturday. Thank you. <laughs>